Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, it feels um, it feels great. If, if if a little bit wintry, I can't quite believe what's happened to the summer. So maybe that is a good thing because it means that people are more inclined to tune in to events such as this rather than bask in the sun. Um, but I'm sure you're here because of the topic that Angela's presenting on hybrid transitions as a space for children's agency, a case study from a pre-kindergarten in Boston. I'm, I know I'm personally very excited to hear um, Angela's presentation. Just a very brief word about the seminar series itself. It falls under the Childhood and Society um, Special Interest Group and Network at Middlesex University. Um, it's, the series itself has been running for over five years and we're now running um, currently fortnightly seminars, So, which is really, really great because it means we get um, to hear from the widest range of scholars within Middlesex Education Department about their latest research endeavours. Um, and I think this is Angela's second presentation in this series, so um, this year's series, so that's really wonderful to hear her work. Um, so yeah, it should, should anyone of you want to present in the future, please just get in touch with me. I lead the SIG and I'd be very, very happy to work with you on, um, on scheduling you into the programme. Um, the intention of the seminar series is, is that it provides a safe platform, um, uh, you're part of a community of people who are interested in what you have to say, keen to hear about your research, and, and we actively encourage you to pose your questions. So as we go along, pop them in the chat and I will gather them up and um, field them and direct them to Angela towards the end. Um, so this is meant as a really um, inclusive and lively Base where we can engage in dialogue about what the various forms that research take um, in childhood and the difference it makes to society. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm going to hand over to Angela, who is now as calm as a swan, um, having had some <laughs> slight um, Wi-Fi issues. So we're beset with technical difficulties today, but she's with us and she's raring to go. So I'm, um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Angela now. If I could just ensure that everybody is on mute, that would be wonderful just to prevent um, interference as we as Angela pre presents. I think we had a dog last time and possibly a child or a plumber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just pop yourself on mute. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, thanks so much, Jane. And thank you for enabling me to share um, uh, my love of uh, self-determination and uh, hybrid transitions with the uh, with you all and thank you for attending everybody um it's it's really nice to be here with you in this digital realm which is very apt actually um and you were all determined when you were in the in a different room to make it into the room that we needed to be into so we're all already hybrid transitioning um i was going to use an example but i don't think i need to because some of us today were in different rooms or we, we, we've come from different places in the world, we've gone from one room to the other, we're physically near our computers uh, or touching them, but we're actually um, now kind of bringing our cognitive kind of awareness and consciousness into, into the space that we're sharing together. But physically, if somebody went past and looked at us, they would physically see us in, in the non-digital realm, but we are sort of experiencing, in, experiencing each other in the digital kind of realm, which is just a, an interesting kind of aspect of kind of where we're going today and where the chapter um, that was written about hybrid transitions sort of um, came from, about the complexities of uh, being physically somewhere, but emotionally, mentally, cognitively, you know, in lots of different spaces all at once and, and, and really untangling that became quite interesting when um, observing uh, children and being in the environment with them. So that's kind of where that came from. So uh, I'll move on to, uh, so the, the case today is a hybrid transition as a space for children's um, agency. Uh, and it's a case study from um, uh, pre-kindergarten in Boston, but actually there was some research undertaken in England and Ireland and um, America, but it hasn't been kind of merged together. So this is just one example from Boston, but I'm hoping later on in the year to be able to do more with this. 
but it's something that um, I'm really interested in transitioning, moving. Um, and my own background working in education, particularly with early childhood education uh, position uh, and working with children, particularly back in the 90s, transition was a term we might have used and in the early noughties we might have used for between home and school environment or it might have been for leaving nursery, going to reception or reception going to um, pro, you know, primary year one. And it's interesting when you look at Eileen uh, Dun when Eileen Wendy Dunlop's work and Liz Brooker's work and again Bronk from Brenner on transition, it becomes so much more complex when you look at that. And you know, we're always transitioning all the time in so many uh, realms and, and uh, areas of our lives that we take it for granted. But there's a lot of um competencies and complexities needed to deal with the transitions that we experience as we 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 went through today just to get onto a, a screen and children are really competent in that and they're doing it without um sometimes without us seeing them we can have a, a, a scotoma where we don't notice what children are doing so um the background of i'll go into the research now but before i do that i really want to just talk about the book um that self-determination kind of uh, created on a PhD journey that's been really interested and fused with lots of different concepts and in, uh, sort of areas but self-determination was something that I've been really interested in um, and it's a band it's it's a term actually and a concept that can be really interlaced with agency and, and is really linked to agency and sometimes in practice as Tisdale, Kay Tisdale, Kay Tisdale talks about that we have um, inherited um, phrases and terms that we use within practice and sometimes we use them and they're very loaded if you look at back team who talks about the loaded phrases and languages that we use um that kind of form our thinking and sometimes we if they're not unchallenged as, as tisdale was talking about we kind of use phrases and terms and concepts without kind of really um having full understanding of them and i as a practitioner you know i can say that that is something when I worked with it, with children that that might have happened with and I know from talking and reflecting with others that's something so to be able to con to edit the book on self-determination was really really powerful and to work with um, some really um, amazing authors um, from Middlesex such as Evelyn Corraldo who um, looked at self-determination and agency of um, children who she'll be presenting I know ne in the next uh, session I think and Sarah Vipond, Clara Donahue, um, Lena Robinson and I uh, can't think of so I've uh, missed out there now and again lots of esteemed uh, colleagues then from far afield um, globally actually and I'd like to thank Federico Farini, um, Associate Professor at uh, Northampton University for the experience he was the lead editor of the book but to have the experience to as a PhD student to be able to bring your kind of concept into reality and to explore it in the depth that you can. It's really exciting, uh, quite scary. Um, so lots of agency and self-determination coming in there. So talk about bringing your uh, concepts to life, um, which is exciting for any um, researcher, author or PhD student. So thank you very much. So. The chapter um, I'm looking at, I'm just going to have to remove the screen here so I can't see your faces, sorry about that. Um, it's a rich um, traditional of pedagogical and psychological um, kind of research that it's explored the impact of technology um, and how that impacts on the cognitive and social development of children. However, when I was uh, beginning to research this, was, this started back from probably 2015 maybe, there was much less research that focused on the implications of the use of digital technologies in educational settings um, regarding children's agency. So um, it was something that really kind of um, began to um, evolve as I began my, my research further into self-determination. And, and the concept of self-determination is quite interesting. And, and again, on my journey, I found that the more I looked at self-determination, it was really entangled with agency. And to be able to kind of like pull it apart, I was really frustrated with it because, you know, 
uh, self-determination, if you're looking at it through social work lens, for instance, becomes really involved in the technical aspects of self-determination to help a client or a child to be determined. You're looking at what you can do to support them to, to, to do that. So when you look at McDermott in 1975, who edited a book and, and had lots of research with social workers, there was um, kind of the idea that self-determination was to enable you would as a social worker do something to support somebody but you would do it for them or you would perceive what they needed so that was quite interesting when I began to explore that and then there was the psycho psychology kind of aspect or self-determination which kind of looked at the intrinsic perhaps motivation or extrinsic motivation and again Ryan and DC's work on self-determination theory was really inspirational for me where they broke down um, autonomy relatedness and competence and that became quite interesting but a little bit frustrating because I positioned myself from early childhood education I didn't kind of know where I sat with self-determination with self-determination self-determination um, and then I realised I was looking at agency and self-determination through educational lens, which I kind of didn't really want to do, but I didn't realise that at the time. So my journey enabled me to realise I want to look at agency and determination in education, but looking at it from early childhood education. And that caused probably be one or two years kind of uh, stress trying to uh, untangle what that meant for me. So that was interesting. So just to give you a bit of background, what went into just, you know, the term self-determination so looking at it through um, a sociological lens I began to be interested in self-determination um, linked from psychology looking at the autonomy uh, competence and relatedness but to think about yes it is an intrinsic maybe motivation that you have a choice to do something but that choice actually really sits within a social context so um, your choice to do something is really impacted on depending on the context that you're in um, and then there's going to be reflection on that and then there's going to be a choice what to do then you're going to act which is the agency and then the consequentiality of the act and the choice is, is something that's really came out from my PhD thesis which I'm excited about but um, I'll carry on with that so there's the book which kind of uh, captures some of the, the, the journey of self-determination um, let's move on there. So in the chapter that I'm presenting now, which is kind of um, a congruent to um, my PhD journey, but very much um, linked, one of the innovations that came out from the chapter and from the research that was undertaken was hybrid transitions. Um, and it's something that was evolving um, throughout the years. It started off as micro transitions, moved towards hybrid transitions. And it's where children's movement from the immersion um, in digitally enhanced experiences generated by educational technologies kind of move in between the non-digital uh, mediated interactions. So when children are interacting with um, digital technology, um, it's the before, the during and the after and the spaces and the realms that kind of uh, are created from that. And I became really interested in that through observation in practice. So that was one of the um, innovations from this research. Um, so, just there. so moving on to this, so hybrid transitions as a theoretical tool um, to conceptualise transitions between the use of digitally enhanced and non-digitally enhanced experiences are dense social spaces uh, where young children show agency um, in their construction and in their co-construction of their knowledge. So they're making knowledge, they're sharing knowledge, they're interacting and negotiating and really kind of um, flipping it and uh, moving it around. And it's really interesting we began to, when you begin to kind of explore that. So rather than temporal sequences, a hybrid transition um, is understood as a social space where children uh, combine digitally uh, based and non-digitally based experiences in the construction and co-construction of narratives. So they take the role of autonomous authors of knowledge and it is argued here that claiming um, authorship of knowledge, children um, uh, display agency and in particular as authors of narratives, children display a type of agency that concerns their um, epistemic status. 
So during hybrid transitions, um, digital experiences are shared via personal narratives, linking ideas together, maybe linking experiences and emotions, similarities and differences. So individual narratives are interlaced in co-constructed groups um, and narrative narrated by children through face-to-face -to -face, um, time together, through their interactions, through their being, um, wanting to be together and their negotiation. The interactive authorship of interlaced narratives is discussed as a form of agency. So because um, it is underpinned by, as I mentioned earlier, choices and reactions um, from one participant to another and from our choices that we have and that we make. So looking at the innovation too from um, the uh, research and chapter, looking at epistemic approach to children's agency, um, agency is a key concept um, in childhood um, studies when we look at James um, 2009 and James and James 2008 and Leonard and Oswald. Oswald in 2013, uh, the concept of agency can trespass the boundaries of capability to indicate that children's participation um, enhances um, social change. So at least within the context of the specific um, interaction that they're involved with and B and uh, the Berserk um, talk about this and it, this is something that I really focused on on my PhD journey which took quite a while to kind of articulate it and um, I have brought it out into the concept of consequentiality so to be for instance um, immersed in a particular context to interact with those around you something happens you reflect on it you make a choice you then act, which is your, um, uh, you, you, you have the agency to act and then you consequent, you have a, a consequence on others. Um, and that's something that I've really like come and honed in and focused on and I'm really enjoying um, this uh, kind of uh, aspect of, of the journey. So uh, the consequentiality um, and the agency are observed when children make autonomous um, uh, kind of choices when they share their knowledge um, and their domains of knowledge which Heritage does a lot of work in and he calls that epistemic status. Um, agency is also observed through children's rights and responsibilities for constructing knowledge um, which Heritage and Raymond's in 2005 call epistemic authority. Um, children's epistemic authority indicates their agency because it entails autonomous capacity of acting um, as a, a knowledge holder in a social inter during social interactions, which Bath um, in 2013, Delberg and Moss in 2005, and Moss in 2009, and Pascal and Bertram in 2009 um, have uh, written about and researched. So the construction of narratives displays agency, but it also displays, um, um, sorry, the construction of narratives display agency, but it also displays narratives that influence the context of children and their social participation. So for instance, opening the possibility for the development of um, mobile identities such as uh, temporal or important um, small uh, group cultures, which Hull Adrian Holiday really uh, does a, a lot of work on where he talks about, you know, how our language and our narratives and what we talk about actually create um, our identities and um, we're able to articulate um, identity and culture which aren't inherited and gives children the opportunity to challenge and change and author their own identity and their own kind of uh, cultural uh, understanding which is again something that I began to explore and look into whilst uh, undertaking this journey. So in this presentation children's epistemic, epistemic um, status and authority are recognised in the authorship of their own stories, their own um, knowledge and their narratives which they move in and out of seamlessly um, you know, in seconds um, between digital and um, non-digital realms and uh, uh, opportunities. So that's kind of what I'm really looking at here, probably a long way to go around it. 
I'll let this put you off. <laughs> so just to share a little bit of the context. Um, so the study um, within uh, the re relating to the chapter um, really focused on um, digitally based learning activities and they were observed um, in a preschool kindergarten in Boston and again they've also been in, observed in other two other countries um, so the research suggests that there hasn't been enough invested in children's services within Boston it was something when um, I was there at the time which is really similar to the UK and Ireland, that more money was needed in the um, services, the resources and the provision. Um, and again, this is no different in Boston. So this is um, setting was um, uh, uh, funded by the government and through the local educational um, uh, grants as well. Um, it was a 45 place nursery, it was full up to capacity with a really big waiting list. And, um, the real cultural uh, diverse mix of families and children and stakeholders uh, predominantly with Latino and Hispanic, Hispanic um, children using the um, services there at the, at the, at the setting. So uh, they were doing lots of work to support language um, in, at that time in, 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 of the observation. So the research and the observation, um, so it concerned uh, looking at children using a particular software that was to support language, um, technical uh, skills, but also language and um, social interaction, particularly for children um, in that setting. It was a, a focus at the time. The computers um, were free access for children and um, I was able to observe the children in the afternoons over a two week period and the uh, research captures eight children um, using the, the uh, equipment and captures some of the examples um, of their interactions. So in this um, um, presentation, uh, I'll be sharing just some of the um, transcript, a transcript that was used in the chapter. So the option, the observations um, were undertaken um, for 30 minute sessions. So I was able to observe um, the sessions, but was also able to follow children, you know, away from the computer when they moved away from it, which was interesting and, and captured digital and non-digital movement and how children have transient knowledge, um, which I'll look at in a minute. So eight children were observed all in all, um, and I was the researcher and um, wrote this up into the book. And I'm just making sure I haven't missed anything out there. Um, yeah, and it was interesting when children were using the digital technology, how they interacted with it and how they moved away from it and then would come back to it and the knowledge and the, um, uh, interactions that they kind of had built up and created kind of sometimes were held or frozen and would kind of they'd have to go off and do something else but then they would just pick it up really really quickly and that became quite exciting to kind of uh, observe and, and to watch as well so the research data used um Um, so whilst I was a participant in the um, environment, I actually didn't take, I was kind of not really involved. I was really watching over so non-participants as such with the interactions, which was um, quite liberating because I wasn't there as a practitioner base and I wasn't sort of taking part in that. So I was able to really have the um, mind space to observe, which was really um intriguing and of course if the children had interacted with me that would have changed the whole concept of me being participant non-participant um, so for the data research i used field notes transcripts of the interactions from audio recorded uh, research data uh, on a small uh, device so the decision to use field notes supported um, the claim for um, hybrid transition um, that their spaces of children's agencies because the field notes were combined with transcripts of interactions between children and the audio recorded um, and were audio recorded 
um, so that I could um, later transcribe um, the interactions to sort of capture uh, high levels um, of, you know, of uh, children's discussion and being able to record it and then transcribe it gave me some more accuracy. Um, I didn't um, utilise conversation um, analysis, um, the convention fully as Hepburn and Bowden um, discuss. Um, I didn't look at pitches, I didn't look at tone, I didn't look at pace and so on and so forth because I was really interested in the analysis of, of the interactions. So that was uh, my choice um, as the uh, principal investigator of the research and that's what I did there. So the descriptions of relevant nonverbal behaviour were added um, from field notes um, to support this uh, research. So. Uh, presentations of findings. Okay, so it's about a vampire game that was uh, enticing the children um, to uh, interact. So initially, the it's a, it was a vampire, and if the children kind of interacted with particular symbols, um, they were able to be uh, rewarded with a vampire who would do particular. Um, uh, kind of reactions uh, and the children learnt what the reactions were so um, let's just go there okay so here we are right so the field notes uh, and the activities involve children um, what I'm going to share now is there's the involves two children age three and four and they're playing a vampire game and um, there were images bouncing across the screen and every time there some words came up starting with the letter v um, and the, it was correctly kind of interacted with a vampire would give a, a kind of a deep and scary laugh um, and kind of movement um, and the field notes um, report what happened during this interaction with the children so <clears throat> Two children squealed with delight, thoroughly enjoying their time, um, being scared whilst observing each other's reactions and their facial contortions, they're kind of reacting to that. Um, enthusiastic screams were undertaken simultaneously with both children theoretically, uh, theoretically trying to outdo each other. So it was kind of, kind of you know, really kind of um, involved in, um, in tune with each other and the reactions kind of uh, afforded each other to respond in particular ways which is quite enjoyable to to watch um, and there was some real kind of theoretical theoret theoretical not theoretical <laughs> uh, theater kind of um can't think of the word i can't say it the theatrical kind of uh, reactions coming out there so the children were kind of outdoing each other and um, continuing their enjoyment of being um, together on, on with the game that they felt comfortable with. So um, in the transcript, the digitally enhanced um, experiences became a pivot uh, for children's agency. Um, and this was expressed in the software that they were using as a resource. Um, they were role playing um, sort of their interactions. So from the digital experience, a rich array of non-digital face-to-face interactions developed. This is suggested from my field notes um, and the documentation that there was a change in the social situation um, and uh, their enthusiasm with the game actually enticed some more children to come over and join them. Um, to see what was going on and then to begin to uh, interact with um, each other. So the sheer joy they displayed during this activity enticed others to join them. Child A continued to control the mouse while B at one point was um, pointing to a screen um, with the V there and the other children who joined, the other four children, um, interacted and colluded and negotiated and problem solved and swapped stories um, from some recent experiences that they had. So here's a um, transcript of what the children, a very small kind of minute uh, section of what their co-constructed narratives kind of turned out to be. So child um, L said, you should have pressed that button 
Not that one. No, said child M. Child L, yes, because when you press it, he waves his arms up and he shows his fangs. Child M, he shrugs and ignores the advice. P, child P, my sister has fangs and she dribbles when um, they're in her mouth. She tries to bite me and chases me and I run away from her. It's fun, but I was scared when I ran and then I fell over. Child L, yes, fangs are scary. They're like straws and they suck up blood like strawberry milkshake. Child P, oh, it's not like strawberry milkshake, and laughs. Child L, teeth are, um, are fangs and we have fangs, look, points to them and then points to the screen. Uh, child M, look what happens when I press this. I bet his fangs come out. Yeah, look, says child M, L, and mimics and waves. And child P mimics and waves as well. So they're responding to each other. And the shared construction of narratives documented by the transcript is, is underpinned by frictionless movements between um, digitally based experiences and non-digitally uh, based experiences. So the material um, and the experiences that the children share through digital and non-digital uh, memories, knowledge, um, it's just two components of the same changing fluid and never less um, life worlds that they cohabit and that they know about and they want to talk about and that they link really, really kind of seamlessly. The observation undertaken suggests that whilst emerging from different um, uh, areas and experiences, digitally enhanced ex experiences and non-digitally enhanced experiences were both used by children to produce complex text but also built through negotiation and a combination of different experiences. The children were interlacing with each other, they were working off each other, they were constructing knowledge and ideas. Um, here's some more examples here. I'll just give you a minute to look at that without me reading it for you. So the context of the interaction is the use of the computer keyboard by child B to play the vampire game. Child B brainstorms um, and transitions from uh, digital to non-digital experiences and realms to share a personal memory. I dressed up and I had a cape and I put hair gel on. Let me just make sure I'm on the right, um, yeah, yeah, slide. So this narrative is presented as a real vampire experience as opposed to the boring predictability um, of the game, of the vampire game. And Child L, if you look there, connects a piece of knowledge about vampires' behaviour to Child B's narratives. An interlacement um, and co-constructed narrative emerges in the transitions between the use of non-digital resources and digitally based resources. Children um, access the, state, um, the status of knowledge knowledgeable producers um, of information and it's accepted um, by each other and they continue to work on that um, uh, sort of interlacement with their kind of agency and their determined choices and reflective kind of uh, uh, reactions. So child A and child Z continue um, to narrate by reinforcing um, valid validity um, about questions and they legitimise narratives that are produced and they take on a role within it um, which cross boundaries about representation and narratives um, and knowledge making. So they're kind of really, really moving in and out of um, knowledge holders, knowledge producers, knowledge makers and they're um, uh, making way um, for uh, displaying their agency and they're making choices to to do that. So during the observations of dig digitally enhanced learning, uh, personal narratives, ideas and experiences and emotions are interlaced in co-construction um, of the narratives and they're co-authored by children. So interestingly, the children are kind of really busy on the vampire game and this is just a really small, um, quick kind of uh, observation actually. Um, but it was quite insightful because they were really, really immersed, concentrated, um, 
uh, working with each other, challenging each other, negotiating, that actually um, this, this was happening in spaces, in realms that you really had to be attuned into to kind of uh, feel it with the children. But actually when you're um, maybe in practice and you're busy and you've got other children to manage, um, it's interesting what you might notice or see. And as an observer, I could see that the children, I could see this richness that was being afforded from being physically at the computer, but then that was being afforded by going in and out of digital realms or visiting um, the game, the, the technical side of it, but then creatively going in and kind of owning the spaces that they were in. But actually, if you're an outside observer and you're doing other things and you're looking over that there, you can really miss these opportunities. And it, it made me reflect as a practitioner, how many times um, have I missed that when I've been working with children, you know, this richness um, of authorship, of agency, and then to look at the behaviour that, that comes from that, either linked to using the digital technology in, in a way that you would want them to, or you, expect, you would expect them to be using it, but actually um, behaviour that immerses the aftermath, the kind of emotional aftermath, the physical aftermath of being in a digital realm and how that then comes out um, into um, the environment and how that impacts in the environment. That became really intriguing to watch and to decipher. So um, a practitioner joins the group to reiterate the um, agreed rules that only two children at a time should be using the computer. So the four children, including child D, who was the one who was doing all the vampire kind of moves on the slide before, were encouraged to leave the computer area and join in with some more structured adult led activities. And again, when I saw this, I could reflect afterwards particularly when I was writing up, um, you know, how many times have I, you know, how, do we do that in practice with children, that the adult agenda kind of moves over. And if we don't tune in, we can miss so much. Um, and the spaces between digital and non-digital and the knowledge that's there and the agentic kind of um, uh, prowess and confidence and um, creations can be missed. And, and this was really insightful as a practitioner a researcher to see that and I've had some really good uh, reflective dialogues with others in practice about this um, and, it, and it continues to be talked about. So the children that were really engrossed, really concentrating, uh, concentrating and, and kind of negotiating and using all of these fantastic verbal skills and creative skills and agentic and determined, self-determined kind of uh, movements were disbanded and instantly that richness, that moment of this mad vampire world um, was kind of uh, moved, it was shifted because of the adult uh, choice. However, Child D continued to laugh whilst using the, his vampire voice and he was physically taking what was happening in, within that digital um, realm and within that, that co-constructed kind of... Uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, world perhaps, and he continued to bring it physically into the environment. There was a real shift there in his um, choice to do that was really evident. Um, and his vampire play was transferred between digital and non-digital um, worlds, spaces and interactions. And this kind of um, transition was really quick, really fast, but it was really purposeful and with intention. But actually the reaction um, to his agentic kind of uh, decision to continue to create his game was really kind of um, uh, reacted to. And the practitioner asked him, come on, stop that now. You, you know, he was pulling on curtains and doing something maybe that a bat does upside down or something to do with a vampire. And um, he was swishing around, which was impacting in the environment. And again, you know, as um, a practitioner, sometimes it's hard to be attuned in to what children are doing, but it really made uh, me reflect on, uh, for the research purpose, how children's behaviour, um, and again, it goes back to something that Tisdale talks about, um, behaviour is, um, agentic behaviour, determined behaviour, can be really kind of seen as, um, it can be labelled, 
but actually, you know, if we're attuned in and we see where it's coming from, it offers you a different insight. Um, so really sort of focusing on Reggio, uh, Malaguzzi and Reggio Emilia approach that to be attuned and to be listening and to be kind of knowing where this knowledge and these intentions are coming from really impacts on how children are being labelled and um, worked and interacted with. So it's something else that, that, that came out there. Angela, can I just interrupt briefly? And um, we're kind of running out of time, so I don't know how much more you still have to present or whether now's a good time to, to take some of the questions. Thank you, Jane. Okay, I've got just three kind of um, points to finish up on, if that's okay. I'll just yeah. kind of do that. So just to, I mean, um, the, the themes of the research and the chapter and the book really kind of brought out three themes. So I'll just kind of really, really quickly go through what they are. Um, so the first theme um, is um, the difference seen that children and adults seem to see when digital technologies are on the go. What adults see and what children see, you know, that discourse and that mismatch, they're really intriguing. And that came out from um, the impact um, to reflect on. So whilst adults calculate a balance between risk and opportunity for children's learning, um, seeing that the digital is an instrument towards successful development, children see um, social space uh, where digital and non-digital resources are seamlessly combined um, to author knowledge and narratives. A theme too was about really evident that came out was transient knowledge. So transient knowledge, the observations undertaken evidence um, that digitally enhanced experiences are used and exchanged in non-digitally uh, mediated uh, interactions um, where knowledge is uh, moved between in the digital realms out of the digital realms to co-construct and to interlace with each other um, and that came out really really um, strongly in the research and in three um, just to conclude and to sum up um, was linked to sociological interpretation of hybrid transitions as spaces for children's agency where knowledge is generated through digital uh, resources to support autonomous choices um, between the digital and the non-digital realms and vice versa. And this is a, con uh, a sort of a continuum um, of an, a temporal condition that relate to hybrid transition. So it's not linear, it's completely entangled and moving. So to conclude, hybrid transitions as a space um, um, for change for and from children, knowledge is generated in the combination of digital experiences and non-digital experiences that are acted and authored by children through their co-construction of, of narratives and their interactions together. So the use of digital technology by a small group of young children can be a context for hybrid transitions that open opportunities to negotiate personal memories and narratives, possibly leading children to the interactive co-construction of small cultures um, which Halliday talks about and researches um, that characterise group identities. So I'll stop there because uh, I'm sorry that it went, um, gone, but I'll uh, come out of the slides there. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Angela. Really rich, interesting, um, and yeah, and has actually um, provoked uh, several questions. Um, the first actually is from Lena, uh, picking up perhaps that final point that you made about hybridity um, as spaces of agency. Uh, Lena asks um, just a thought about hybridity as a term and a, as a way of framing your work, hybrid transitions. I'm wondering why these experiences are identified as hybrid. What experiences in children's childhoods are not hybrid? Do you want to add anything to that, Lena? No, no, no. Just over to Angela. So, uh, Lena, you're asking why is it called hybrid? Is that right? Yes. So I wondered if I'd actually missed something vital there. Um, um, why would digital and non-digital experiences be more hybrid than other children's experiences? That's all. Yeah. Um, yes. So, well, when, when hybrid was uh, con created, the hybrid transition, actually it started off as a micro transitions. When I was in the field and I was researching, I could see these movements all the time, sort of back and forth and um, 
you know, the digital, the non-digital, and it was very much in the educational um, field. It was very much like, this is the digital time, you're going to go on and you're going to do this. Um, it was kind of coming out through the, the research that there were set times, although it was a free flow approach, children could go on it. And so that it was very much kind of, um, uh, kind of this is uh, the digital kind of uh, interactions um, that you are going to be exploring either the technical side of it or this is the content that we want you to get um, or you're doing something that's not digital but actually it was really evident that there were spaces that were not either that it wasn't to do with um, being on or offline those polarized kind of um, positions didn't really kind of they, they didn't capture the movement. So of course, if you look at it out of a context, uh, children are micro uh, transitioning all the time, but we need a framework, Lena, you know, you have to have a framework to what you, for what you're doing. So hybrid transition was used because children were using the digital and the non-digital, but they were moving, they were more than that. And hybrid captured, um, is a phrase that captured, um, it is a concept that captured actually that children are making uh, new knowledge they're making new um uh spaces and it is hybrid so that's why it was used maybe i'll have a chat with you um why why digital later um be fascinated to talk about this more um why digital online stuff is any different to books print books yeah, of course. I mean, I'd love to have a chat with you, Lena, in detail. That would be really exciting. Yeah, no. Moving on. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Lena. And Claire has a question. Claire, do you want to ask it yourself or do you want me to pose it to uh, Angela? Hi. I just, it was just, um, Angela, it was something from um, early on when you mentioned the sort of three aspects of Ryan and DC's work on motivation. And you said autonomy and relatedness and i missed the third one and i was just curious oh it was it's uh, competence that their self-determination theory is really interesting claire it's um they've broken self-determination into like um three spheres so autonomy competence and relatedness um really interesting because like if you look at the, you know your competence you need for competence you, you know you, you're able to do something and you, you've got the skills to do it but you do need the context of the people with you to believe in you and to offer praise for you to sort of continue to move on. Relatedness, you need to, you know, this is a really quick overview. You need to relate and have a kind of relationship and or relate to the place, the people, the thing that you're doing. Um, and autonomy is that, you know, obviously to be going off to, 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 to do what it is that needs to be done. So they, that's a really quick nutshell look, but they're really interesting spheres that Ryan and DC look at. But one of the problems I had for my research, it wasn't a problem, but I couldn't find my positionality. I didn't know if I was looking at self-determination through education, through sociology, through, um, you know, different, you know, there's political aspects of self-determination. If you look at a country to be determined, for instance, and to have their governance, or if you're looking at it, however, and, and I wasn't quite looking at it through such, uh, psychology but I did use Ryan and DC's concept um, and I bridged over to sociology by, by looking at the individual choice that we make is very influenced by the social context that we're in um, and that was kind of took me about two years just to to do that and then I was able then to say that we make a choice you know children were making a choice because of the interactions in the social context that they had they reflected and then decided to do something or not which was when you act as your, you know, the agency kind of side of it. And then consequentiality, what impact does that interaction with that move make? So that, that's where Ryan and DC kind of really linked there and a lot of Weimarer's work. Thank you. No, that's really interesting because I, I knew about their stuff on motivation, but not the stuff on self-determination. So um... Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. And Lisa, do you want to pose it to... Um... To Angela, or would you like me to ask it? I'm happy for you to ask it, Jane, thank you. Okay, so um, Angela, are you aware if there is any evidence of self-determination, self-determinated behaviours in the new Early Years Foundation Stage curriculum or B25M? 
Sorry, oh. birth, birth to five matters. Sorry, Jen. I don't know what B25M is. <laughs> the, like, the, birth, like, the birth to five matters. Okay, there's, <laughs> I've learned something new today. I knew Angie yeah. would know because we've been talking about it in the past. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, 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 new, the new birth to five matters is, is, is great because they're looking really above more than looking at, you know, stages and what you can do. They're looking at, um, I've forgotten the word now, Lisa, uh, not realms. Um, is it realms? Yeah, no, they look, the, the stages, isn't it? The children are in, not ages. Yeah, yeah but they've, and they've called it something else. There's a new term and I just can't, I've, I was talking about it yesterday. It's, is it, it begins with R. It's either, it's, it's, so children are working, um, what's the word? Does anybody here who's an early years know? I have got it in front of, I haven't got it's, it in front It's called, it's, it begins with R, it's either a realm or a, so you're looking, you're not looking at somebody, you know, a child to do something at this particular stage and age. It's more about you're working towards it, which is really powerful. Um, and there's lots of stuff in there about, um, you know the auto you know autonomous children but self-determination i do you know what i need to have a look lisa thank you for that i will have a little look because i know they've obviously dumbed down characteristics of effective learning so it worries me that something as rich as this if they're going to dumb down characteristics of effective learning then it just worries me that's all that something as, as fabulous as this uh, might be overlooked well, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, Lisa, because if self-determined choices, if a child is making a choice and it's not, it's really interesting because it can be seen as a child is being sub, 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 sub uh, what's the word I'm looking at, sub, subservient, gosh, sorry, my brain isn't working today, I was up to oh, You've so. done so much today. <laughs> Subvert, it, you know, it's interesting to think, are children subverting adults? That's the word I'm looking for. So, for instance, when a child does something, um, it can be seen that the child's choice, be it a choice that would be determined or through an agentic act, um, are they, you know, subverting what an adult wanted? Now, who's to say what a child is doing in in a, in a context, um, in an educational context, should be labelled and, uh, you know, in particular way or not? And it's really interesting um, when you kind of begin to explore that. And a lot of early years research now went to a really fantastic um presentation last week on, on, on just that thing on, on children's actions and their choices um, being perceived as subverting adults or not and that's interesting in its own right and then the power particularly within an educational context where an adult can choose well actually I don't you know agree with this choice it's not my choice was and then there's an argument there and I'll just stop in a moment but with self-determination it's really interesting you can look at it if an adult it, doesn't support a child's voice or choice is that negative or not but actually when children come up with um, or anybody actually when you come up with um, somebody who stops you from doing what you want it, it doesn't mean that it's going to take your determination away it can mean that you learn other skills um, and are determined in different ways um, and as uh, Warmie talks about she talks about manipulation and is that good or bad and manipulation if it's from adults it seems good but if it's from children it seems maybe not as good another story but it's quite interesting uh, yeah thanks and mona thank you mona said it ranges the word the r word you ranges know. thank <laughs> you mona. I, i'm so sorry i was up to about four <laughs> this morning and i my brain isn't working today oh, no, your all. brain's working really well <laughs> thanks <laughs> it's ranges thank you mona i i couldn't get that out this morning. i couldn't i knew it was r but i couldn't say the word and ranges is wonderful because if you're going to have anything that children do rather than expecting something if there's a range there's much more kind of scope there for children and their choices <laughs> right so i think we have to leave today on the word rangers and just to thank you so much angela for um a fabulous presentation and um for everybody for coming along um so yeah do join us for the next one in the series in two weeks time okay thanks everyone